Straight away you feel like they're at a disadvantage. Mm. But I worked with a group, I'd say about 15 of them. And by the end of the year, the gains they had made matched the children who were in, let's say, the most able group. Wow. And some surpassed. Wow. And all it took was for someone to say, you know what, you can do this. Yeah. So we're about to interview Charlene Brown, Year 6 teacher at Free Bridges Primary School in Ealing, Southall. When I first walked into Charlene's classroom, I was like, wow. I want to be a child in this classroom, in this here environment, because it's so powerful, it's so inspirational. All of the images, all of the text, all of the clarity you see around learning. And Charlene's created a real culture of learning around excellence and aspiration for her kids. What we go through today in the interview, Charlene shares some of the unique and really powerful skills that she's been sharing with the children in order to help them to aspire to greatness and to become the best versions of themselves. We talk about Singapore maths, talk for writing and so much more. Charlene is such an inspiration and I can't wait for you to sit down, listen and learn from her experiences, her insights on education. There's no mistakes, there's no mistakes. <laughs> It, it literally is a, a, a casual conversation. I see you've got your teacher pose on now. Look. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I I'm never serious. sit like this. I never sit like I never sit, really. I think people think we sit at a desk. You can see I don't even have a desk. It's oh, yeah. just... <laughs> it's I've just, got, just the got the computer, computer because I need it. Yeah. But other than that, I don't have a desk. Like, they have desks. Yeah. And I move in and out of the tables. But I never sit, really. So, like, 20, how was it? like 25 years ago, mm. when I was in school, Teacher is usually like set the work and then sit at the desk yeah. and just like watch and then read the newspaper or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. Not all of them, by the way, just yeah. most of them or many of them. Or um, dictate from behind their desk. Yeah. Like telling you what to do, not even yeah. getting up to interact with you, telling yeah. you from far. Yeah. Four plus four, yeah. work it out. <laughs> <laughs> yours, yours, you can do it. Go I on. can't imagine doing that now. I think Jeremy might sack me. <laughs> What's the biggest change you think in education since you were a child in that school? Um, I think, so if I think back to being in primary school, I went to a primary school that was quite similar mm. to Three Bridges. So um, a great mix of cultures, very enthusiastic teachers. It really? was a beacon school. Oh. And I think I must have been in school when the creative curriculum mm. came about because I just remember doing things all creative and I absolutely loved it. But I knew there wasn't so much of a focus on the data I produced as a child and taking tests and so on. Because I know these guys will remember me in year six because we took a great test. Right. As opposed to all the other things that encompass a whole, a whole year. I do remember having meetings in primary school about doing a test and doing very well. Mm. But I don't remember the actual process. Right. of sitting through it. So the creative curriculum came in when you were in school? So my school was a school where I wouldn't say they were leading mm. in the things that they did, but it was almost like thinking a bit ahead wow. of other schools. So I just remember being just encompassed, all engulfed in art projects all the time, um, going out into the community, whether it be to an old people's home or fundraising, going you know, for a run in my pyjamas, Red Nose Day, and wow. lots of painting, big murals, um, still bands coming in so we could learn musical instruments. I missed that's, out on a lot then, because yeah, I never had any of that. That's what I remember from primary school. Sports, I loved sports, athletics, cricket, football. Do you know what sports was to me when I was in primary school? Bottle tops. <laughs> <laughs> Literally kicking the ball through oh the goal with a bottle top. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. So I think... I must have been quite lucky to go to a primary school like that and that's what led me to think you know what I could get back into primary school mm. because my experience was fantastic yeah, yeah amazing amazing see my my experience is completely almost the opposite because my schooling was so mediocre in a sense and so little focus on creative subjects on the arts on drama music mm. sport anything like that so that I that's what inspired me to create my vision of making sure that that was yeah. a part, core part of the curriculum. And yours is almost the opposite, where you had such a great experience, you wanted to reinvent that for yeah. yourself. It's powerful. It was good. And I can't... See, I used to think that all primary schools lived like ours. Mm. But I think we must have been maybe a slight 
anomaly because a few people I speak to um, have Wait, a similar where did you go experience. In Labbert Grove. Right, wow. Yeah. Um, and that's the things, or maybe they're just the things that stuck with me. I enjoyed writing mm. and I enjoyed maths, but I know that they weren't the focus yeah. in that school. Okay. I can, if I think about the things that my mum's kept, you know, the momentums, the cherished art projects that I've created, yeah. it, that shows me that maths and English wasn't the biggest focus okay. for them as a school. So take us back then, so how did you get to where you are today as a year six teacher at Free Bridges? Um, so I, it started, I must have been in my mid-twenties when the job I was in just wasn't offering me what I needed. Mm -hmm. There was no challenge there, you know, I could do it with my eyes closed and was I thought it I need or a different industry? it wasn't it was hairdressing okay <laughs> and I just thought I need a challenge I need something big mm -hmm. and I thought okay I'll go to uni do a degree that would have some purpose mm. for me in mm -hmm. my life so I looked into a school where I could volunteer first, mm -hmm. just get my foot in the pool, yeah. make sure I enjoyed it. The school was an independent boys school in Notting Hill mm. and it was a great experience. Fantastic. But within six weeks, the head teacher said to me, you need to be a teacher. Yeah. She said, I'll help you find any course that's out there. I'll support you. Just find it, sign up as soon as possible. So I signed up to St. Mary's in Twickenham, yeah. started my honors, and then, yeah, four years later, I did the honours and QTS all in one course. Yeah. And then that led me here to Three Bridges. And you've been here how long now? So I'm now in my seventh year. Wow. So it's not, the, it's not as long as some. Yeah. But in terms of the teachers here, mm. it seems like a long, yeah. a long time. Because I've seen the evolution of the school in, this, in these seven years. Yeah. yeah, and there's really a stickiness here with a mm. lot of the staff, isn't there? Why oh, there definitely is. is. Um, there's, something, there's something here. I can't, I don't think I can even explain what it is. But there's something here that makes you feel like a, you are important, mm. and B, there is no, I, think, I, I don't even know what to say, there is no, I wouldn't say there's not pressure from management, but management know that they've employed you, mm. they've employed you for a reason, mm. and they trust you. Yeah to do what you need to do. Yeah. So there's full autonomy on us. Yeah. And I think coming from university and PGEs or however, ITTs, however we got here, we are full of ideas. Mm. We're just bursting. We're dying to get that first class and show what we can do. And then you get into a school that suppresses you. Yeah. There's nothing worse. Yeah. Whereas here, you could just go for it. Like my classroom looks like a big rainbow. I because <laughs> I was saying before we started, right? Like I want to be in year six now. Yeah. I want to be a kid in your classroom. It's so different, isn't it? To when people went to school, I think a long time ago. Mm. Shortboard. So you're welcome to come back and be a student <laughs> in year six. I would love to, honestly. <laughs> I want to come and learn about some of this ratio stuff and percentages and bar modeling. Just, Don't forget words. And cres Keywords. Crescendo and yeah, crescendos. And, <laughs> and gadding. Somebody was telling me about a gable end actually when I was, um, yeah, I was looking at a property the other day and they were showing me about a gable end and a hip end. And yeah. I just seeing it on your wall and I was like, I couldn't learn that in year six. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> but that's, um, but we have so much fun teaching. Mm. And I think years ago, people looked at teaching like a vocation. So mm. you got into it because you wanted to make a difference. You mm. had something to offer. You were inspired or you were full of ideas or you were very good at something in particular that mm. you could pass on to another generation. And then over the years, I feel like that's been stripped back mm. slightly and it's now more like, okay, I'll get into it because I get holidays or yeah. I'm in, but I want to get out. That's a common theme, isn't it? I yeah. get into it because I want to get holidays and it's kind of like pension sorted. Mm. Mm. That's not why you get in. Yeah. People like that, they get found out very quickly here yeah. because you stand out. Got it. You stand out in a team of people who come in and love what they do. Yeah. And it shows yeah. in the way we approach visitors, the children, you know, tasks that we might get in a staff meeting through CPD. Yeah. So if you are not passionate about what you do or mm. you're not bringing that inner 
love for teaching, yeah, yes, it shows. Yeah, I love it. So talk us through a little bit about, because you've obviously got SATs coming up here now. Mm -hmm. Talk us through a little bit about what you're teaching the children now through numeracy, literacy, and how you're pushing them through that, that next phase of their lives, really. Okay, so we, we have um, quite a lengthy English and maths lesson. So we have roughly around 90 minutes a day mm -hmm. for each, which is a long time. That's a whole football match. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a long time to teach English and it's a long time to teach math. So mm -hmm. by lunchtime, they've done three quite intensive hours mm -hmm. of the core subjects. So the afternoons now are still PE, art, science, history, geography, you know, we might have the odd trip here and there. We're mm -hmm. not chopping the curriculum sure. just to fit SATs in. Yeah. That said, you know, to be transparent, we will get closer and we will look at target children who need a bit of acceleration or maybe just a quick 10, 15 minutes at lunch yeah. and get them in and see what we can do to help them. Mm. But I think it's targeting them early mm say year four yeah. maybe year five yeah. so that you don't have to wait until year six yes. and cram their poor little brains full yeah. of all this information yeah it comes overload right mm. like all too much too soon yeah so you're building, that, building those stages up and because you've been here for seven years and a lot of teachers this is where teacher retention is so powerful because then you can see the journey and you can you can have a part in playing in supporting that journey to make sure that by year three, year four, year five, they are building those building blocks so when it does come to the SATs, it becomes easier for them yeah. and something that's more manageable. Exactly, and what we're finding, so a couple of years ago, I've been in year six, three years now, and what we're finding is that it's the newer children who join us from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, that's where we put the most work. Yeah, got it. Because they haven't come in with the foundations that we've given you know, three bridges children. Yeah. And, you know, nothing against the primary schools they've come from, mm -hmm. but we are having to maybe build them up slightly yeah. just so they reach the standards Makes of sense. the kids here. So tell us about the Singapore math program that you have here, how it works, because I really want, I'm really fascinated and curious about it, mm. and I want to learn more about how that works. Okay, so the Singapore maths program came about, I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say, four years we've been on this journey, maybe five. Uh -huh. And in its infancy, Jeremy, as he does, mm -hmm. had his hand in it mm -hmm. straight away and said, this is incredible. This is something we can be a part of. It's aligned with what we're thinking as a school. And a few of the teachers here, including um, Jeremy, they got to contribute towards the making mm -hmm. of the scheme, mm -hmm. the writing of the books, which is powerful in itself. We, we look at a problem in maths as a whole class, and that's what's known as the runway yeah. that everybody's on. Okay. So before anything takes off, mm -hmm. we're all on. We're all on board. This is the problem. We can read it, we can talk about it. And then what happens is the children are then attacking that problem from so many different angles that there'll be something that suits everyone. So talk us through that journey about how you how you make that work in a classroom setting. Does everybody work on the same problem in a different way on different tables? Or? It's one problem for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so everyone's faced with the same problem at the start mm -hmm. and how they choose to approach it, it's up to them. There's no right or wrong way. Yeah. There's just more efficient ways of doing it. Sure. So nobody's method so is incorrect. So give us incorrect. an example of a, of a problem that you would have to solve. Okay, so if I just take a quick spin round. Yeah. I'm trying to look for one where they came up with different examples. So let's say the one, two, three, the fifth anchor chart yeah. with the ratio. Yeah. So there are two strips of ribbon, for example, and the shorter piece is three fifth the length of the longer piece. Yeah. And then the person to the right, Holly, says the ratio is three to five. Yeah. So it was looking at how we could figure out the length of each piece of ribbon. Yeah without any numbers, but just using the ratio and knowing that it's three to five. Right. So me as a teacher straight away, I looked at the problem and then I cut card up to match the ribbon. So mm -hmm. on the table, there was green card, orange card, and straight away they could start folding, start labeling, start you know cutting it up if they needed to. And every table had a different variation of how you find the lengths yeah. of each of these ribbons. Yeah. So then me as a teacher now, I leave them for about 15 minutes, then we start to gather ideas and I record them 
on mm. this huge poster. Yeah. And then we start talking about the most efficient method. Which method is the most useful? Yeah. Which one serves us today? Yeah. Then they go off to their maths journals and they're able to voice their own thinking mm -hmm. in their own way. Yeah in their journal so the journals are always very different as well so it sounds very independent in yeah terms of the way very child-led yeah very very much child-led you are literally the facilitator mm. the questioning maybe the structuring if they're going off track bringing them back again sure. maybe some scaffolding for those who might be struggling slightly mm -hmm. but you would hope that the conversation during the problem is so rich that everybody's taken at least something yeah. away from it. Yeah. The more able will take everything yeah. and they'll get to their journals and they'll have a great time. Yeah. But those who are struggling, you might have to go over and offer a piece of advice, but you wouldn't tell them what to do. You wouldn't give them a sheet that they stick in and fill in the missing you know, answers because that's not thinking and, at all. And in, your, and in your experience, what's the greatest advantage to that as opposed to a more teacher-led approach, which some might perceive as faster? I think, well, the, adv the first advantage would be problem solving skills, mm. which I think are invaluable in yeah. this day and age. To For solve sure. a problem on your own, everyone can tell you how to solve the problem if they've done it before you. Yes. But the way you attack it might suit you better mm. than the way I say. Sure. So their parents have been taught through rote learning. Yeah. Maybe back in countries where they were born, Somalia, somewhere in Asia. Mm. But their kids are now coming home and saying, Mum, it's not the only way. Go ahead. Like, your way is not the... <laughs> there's other ways of solving the same problem. And this is fascinating because it's, it's really instilling a high degree of creativity and critical thinking within the children. So when they go out to the wider world, they can perceive a problem and then think about how they're going to solve that problem mm. and then go and solve it as yeah. opposed to going well i know the answer to this question and only this question mm -hmm. but to apply it in a wider context then becomes more difficult for me because i've only learned it one way yeah i only know one way to solve the problem so if i can't do it then i can't do that thing mm. when yeah. actually you can you just take another another route another route yeah i love yeah. that yeah i love that so, and, sorry go oh sorry so i was just going to say the whole process itself um, can be reordered like they have textbooks as well so before you even open a textbook you've explored a problem almost so much until it's exhausted mm. so when you do open the textbook they're so familiar that from then the lesson starts to pick up pace and that's when you take off yeah and hopefully even if it goes too far for some children mm -hmm. they were on board at the beginning and they've got something because i think that's the hardest thing teaching a class of kids it's making sure everybody takes away something each day yeah and if they're not then you've got to look back at your own practice which is why we do our lesson study research yeah. and we look at how are we making sure that everybody is getting something within the lessons that we teach. Got it. And how do you do that with a group of 30 children? Because some people might be like quite, find that quite difficult or be not quite clear on how to actually manage a group of 30 children. How do, how do you do it? I would say, so in the beginning you get a new class, that's probably the most difficult time, but that is when you put the feelers out. You spend those first four or five days mm. getting to know your class mm. what they're good at where they struggle who works well together who doesn't you know who needs more help here who needs more support here yeah. maybe your english seating plans don't match your math seating plans yeah. because they have different strengths and weaknesses and then from there usually i know a lot of schools look at planning and how you plan your lessons but i don't think a lesson plan tells you Mm. how well they got on it's the outcome in the book right so we're quite big here on feedback like instant feedback love it while they're working on the task mm. you are hovering and you're constantly moving around the class yeah. looking at how they're getting on are they on the right track if not bring them back yeah. now today there's yeah. nothing worse than kids going home you open the books let's say on a friday even <laughs> and they didn't get it and they've got saturday and yeah. sunday and then on monday you're like you know that thing you did on friday it's, it's kind of wrong but don't worry about it because it's friday it's like it's three days and ago now you've now. got a new to topic and to now tackle. yeah so we have to hit them sorry That's we right. have to get them straight away so the instant feedback 
has removed a lot of our marking load yeah. because we're talking about it on the spot yeah, as opposed it. to when they've gone home. Like now, half four, when they're relaxing, I'm marking, realising mm. there are errors, but I can't talk to anyone yeah. about it. And you can't change it in yeah. that moment. Yeah, that's really, really powerful. Mm. And then you've got a... You've got a lot of books behind us, and we spoke just before the cameras came on about reading. Yeah. What's your philosophy on reading, and why is it so important to you? I think reading is where it all begins. If I think back to my own childhood, I had maybe two bookcases mm. such as this in my bedroom because I loved books, and I think that's why I don't remember the laborious task of writing because I could mm. write Got but it. that came from a love of literature yeah. and parents who read books yeah. as well Helpful. I think now we're having to work a lot harder to get kids to read we're almost having to sell reading really to them like market oh there's a great book out there there's a great author because a lot of our kids aren't coming from homes where reading is let's say a, a pastime yeah when I was a kid, it was just like Enid Blyton, C.S. Lewis, from your book, and I was just like, in it, <laughs> don't disturb me, I was just in it for hours until it was complete. I think we had less distractions, mm. so where they've got multiple choices when they get home, whether yes. it be PlayStation, tablet, laptop, phone, mm. we didn't have all those choices, and I think we went to books as a source of adventure. Yeah as such because yeah. the people in the books were having adventures yeah. and they were fun to read but to get them to read books in that style now mm. is quite a challenge so what we do is we incorporate a lot of reading into the English lesson okay. so year six read every single day of the week great they just have to and what about the other year groups today they the same the other year groups um, have a big focus on reading using mm -hmm. our cafe strategies but it isn't as intense as it is in year six. What we're trying to do is A, prepare them for the SATs where they'll face three random pieces of text that mm -hmm. even we don't know what they'll be. Right. So we've got to do as much as we can in order for them to feel comfortable. Yeah. And also when they get to secondary school and they approach the likes of Shakespeare mm -hmm. And so on mm. we need to have exposed them I think to as much text as possible Certainly. while they have their own free choice of reading we go to the library once a week they can take these books home every day yeah if they choose to and they right. can read any book from in the school nice. I don't really mind yeah. but I am fully aware that they have to read age-appropriate text yeah as well and then you're giving them that autonomy you're giving them the structure and you're giving them the environment and then they're yeah. taking the ownership and then take the learning into, into their own hands that's powerful and you've got a process here called talk for writing yeah talk us through that so the talk for writing process it once again I would say if I was to link it to the Singapore maths mm. it starts the kids on an even keel so everybody is able to verbally retell a story and mm -hmm. that's how it begins there are lots of pictures so I oh I have one up at the moment I have a story map yeah. going on so there are lots of pictures scripted out by me mm -hmm. and then it looks like hieroglyphics and no, that that probably sounds like a really ignorant thing to say no but it's not because hieroglyphics told um, they had a message right so these tell the story of a mystery of a young girl going missing now, mm. to the untrained eye, no, mm. it doesn't. Mm. But to my kids, they could come in and I could say, hey, tell Jazz this story. And they'd start with the speech marks at the beginning and they'd tell you the whole story just looking at the pictures. Right. So that's something we learn all together. So mm. what that does is it enables every child in here to have a story mm. memorized up here, internalized, mm. so that when we come to writing, there's a structure embedded so how does the pictures come into play? How do you disseminate and share that information to the class so that they understand it? And what does that process look like? So I would say you would start with uh, the genre that, yeah. you, that you want them to learn. You'd mm -hmm. also look at the grammar features mm -hmm. you want them to learn. Mm -hmm. And then you'd compile a model text. Yeah. So a story that mm -hmm. incorporates your genre and your grammar. Mm -hmm. all in one. There might be one out there already mm -hmm. that you can use. Or you might have to become the author. And write it yourself Understood. so a lot of times I write the story myself because I know what year six need before they leave yeah 
Then we look at each paragraph one by one and I'll say the first sentence, they'll look at the pictures, the pictures will match the words that I'm saying Yeah. and they'll repeat it back. There's actions going on, there's yeah. dances, there's noises, there's claps. So you're embedding the, yeah. the, the routine and the, mm -hmm. the physiology behind it as well. So whatever it is they need to learn, by the end of a few days they can recite the whole story Got all it. the way through. Yeah. If you find you've got a class where there's a you know a group of children who struggle with mm. this process you can also say the punctuation as well yeah so you can say full stop exclamation mark the younger ones do downstairs yeah but then when it comes to their writing they're thinking about that structure and they're saying full stop as they're writing mm. as well yeah so it's, it sounds quite young mm. and a lot of high schools don't have this mm. And we do our best in year six to phase this out. So by the summer, yeah. they won't have talk for writing okay. because a lot of year sevens don't have talk, talk for, for writing. For writing. And we yeah. wouldn't be doing them any service if we sent them off thinking that high school had story maps and mm. actions and marching. And sure. Yeah, it wouldn't be fair. But what it does is it just sets them on such a strong path in terms of their writing, writing stories you can have a look you'll feel free to have a look i'm yeah. always showing off their books and the stories they write because i know i didn't write like that at 10. yeah fantastic but that's come from a good foundation being set and then showing them how they can move away from the one i've written yeah and use all the elements from other authors and make their writing even better yeah so i don't make this one too difficult or too exciting because i say it's their job yeah. to create one that's even better than mine what three words do you think your children would use to describe you as a teacher? Uh, I, I know the first word that they would say would be strict. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only because my expectations of them are very high. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when kids come to your class where they haven't had as high expectations, yeah. you can be seen as quite strict. Yeah. But then when you sit down with their parents at parents' evening and they are so proud of their books, and they're they I can hear them in the hallway celebrating the work they've done. And mm. the parents say, my goodness, look at your handwriting. Mm. Look how much you're writing in your stories. And I'm in here feeling like, yeah, yeah. if you want to call me strict, yeah. like I'll be that, yeah. I don't mind. If that gets the best result, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's so powerful. Even um, one of my colleagues who was on a course um, called Landmark the other day, and I went on it a couple of years ago. And he come back and he was like, yeah, it was great. And I got so much from it and this, I like this and I like that and I like this and I like that. And then he said, I still struggle with some of the, the bits in between though. And I'm still not quite clear about this. And I don't like the way that they do this. And I, and I asked him, did you get what you wanted from it? Yeah. Like, yeah. So that, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, avoid all the other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and the other stuff is always going to be there because mm. you have to struggle to, to, you have to go through a period of rigor to, in order to get, the freedom and the outcome that you want. Mm. Um, I don't know if you know Andrew Morris. No. He's an experienced leader in education. Um, I think he's from up in Birmingham. But he sp speaks about this thing called um, rigor create freedom. And it's exactly what you're talking about in terms of taking them in the pit, it came to a moment of un misunderstanding, not being clear about stuff in order to come out the other side, mm. in order to be more enlightened, more understood, and, um, and really express yourself in that creative and powerful way. So yeah, it works. So um, if I think about a second word, I think they might say funny. Mm. If I think about words they've used to describe me. That's a nice balance, isn't it? Yeah, they say funny. Mm. Because we can enjoy ourselves. And I say to them, there's nothing wrong with coming in and having a laugh in class, yeah. but we gotta know when to stop. Sure. We can enjoy ourselves, we can let our hair down, we can have a great time while learning mm. as long as we know that there's a, a boundary. Yeah. And we don't take it too far. Yeah. You see, when I was, when I used to teach PE, that was quite straightforward for me because A, it's outside and it's quite dynamic and interactive anyway, but B, because I only had ever had one class for an hour. Yeah. How do you maintain that balance having the, the class for the whole day or the majority of the day? I think the lessons are so, the lessons are so different and within an English lesson, because it is quite long, there are four chunks. Mm. So it's not the same task rolling through from mm. nine until half ten. Mm -hmm. They might do a bit of grammar, some reading, some writing, some of the story map. 
-hmm. and then before you know it the bell rings mm -hmm. and some of them are not even ready to sure. go because they're so into what they're doing right. so I think planning lessons where there are breaks or you don't stay for too long on one particular task that doesn't serve a purpose mm. either and if I think about being a child I don't want to do one thing for too long unless I've chosen to do it yeah so because I've asked them to do something in particular I wouldn't make them sit on it for hours mm. and hours I don't yeah. think that's fair got it makes sense and it's the same thing that we go through as adults right mm. to a sense and I, I um, spoke the other day about the difference between like reacting and responding and often we're just like reacting to circumstances whereas actually if we plan ahead and actually think about what we're doing before before the storm hits us as per se then we can be more effective by responding by having a thought out process for how to deal with the challenge or problem mm. as opposed to just reacting to everything like first hand because the, there's this feeling of like overwhelm this feeling of anxiety this feeling, feeling of um, you know uncomfortableness if we're constantly doing that yeah and that leads to stress which nobody likes no yeah wellness is a powerful thing in education right now and that's something that is being stemmed right away through the education community how do you go about looking after your own health your well-being so i'm quite fortunate here i would all well, i would say that i was fortunate because we're offered the opportunity to have five days mm. for well-being Right. and they can be planted wherever in the school year yeah. that you need them uh -huh. and I think for a head teacher to step back and say okay well this job can get so pressurized that mm. if you need a day mm -hmm. just take a day don't yeah. come in we'll cover you relax at home mm -hmm. unwind take a deep breath then come back ready yeah. the next day and I think it's almost it was almost I think linked a lot to do with your mind because mm -hmm. knowing that you have those days you're almost you feel better straight away mm -hmm. so I don't feel like I need to take days I've used my days mm -hmm. but not for because I needed to rest for a family function yeah but I think the idea that my head trusts me enough to know that if I'm getting too overwhelmed mm -hmm. I'll just say I need a day sure. and I can have that day to myself mm -hmm. I don't have to offer up my planning to anyone. No one comes to check that I've marked the kids' books. Mm. So I'm not going home. I used to have a trolley. Mm. <laughs> you know the little air hostess trolley that you pull along behind you? Yeah. With my 30 books going home to mark them in depth, yeah. comments in every single one, sometimes 60 for maths and English. Yeah. And I don't do that anymore. Yeah. I just leave arms swinging. Because you're feeding back on the spot because you're the it's the instant feedback the verbal yeah. feedback so I feel like because of management acknowledging that there are more important things we need to do during the day and mm -hmm. removing those pressures of in-depth planning in-depth marking data analysis I don't even feel like I have to go away and do things that are good for my well-being yeah. because I feel well rested yeah. when I go home Makes because I'm sense. not taking anything home mm. on the weekend I'm not sat with my laptop trying to plot out days and days of lessons that I have to show someone before I start teaching them yeah. how, do you, how do you plan your lessons I've got a great team so mm. there's three of us in year six and we get together on a Monday afternoon and we look at the curriculum as a whole mm -hmm. across key stage two and also what they have to do in year six and then in the summer we look at what they have to do in year seven yeah and what we do is we divide it among the three of us okay so i i wouldn't say i'm in charge of reading but i plan reading for the whole of year six to make sure that everything is covered sure. and we don't miss a trick just because of how huge it is yeah and it was a target for us as a school our SATS results in reading had to improve so we looked at how we can facilitate that for the kids what yeah. we can do for them to ensure that they were ready and they left here confident readers so you lead on the reading and then somebody else leads on something else in terms of the yeah. planning and you share the resources to but we plan together yeah but while we sat there because those two hours mm. go like nothing, nothing. <laughs> exactly mm. so while we're sat there we're still talking to each other still conversing about what we need what we should do but one of us is preparing the resources yeah 
for maybe grammar and writing, for maths, for reading, and then we bring them all together yeah. and we share them across the team. And what sparks your interest outside of education, outside of school life? Well, see, I found education so interesting that I went back to studying myself. Yeah. No, I decided that I wanted to just look at another pathway into management in mm -hmm. school. So I was just strongly encouraged here to do further education, which mm -hmm. I wanted to. Yeah. But it takes up a lot of your time yeah. after work. So it does help working somewhere where I don't have to take too much out of the building mm -hmm. because I can focus on being in the library or studying at home, researching, reading, writing mm -hmm. on my own. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you have any sort of hobbies, fitness hobbies, like running, swimming, jumping, climbing? Um, I, ha I haven't been as active. So I used to play football. Oh, wow. Brilliant. And then broke the left foot a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, and that's kind of put me off. I'm almost scared to re-injure myself. Mm. So I looked into more, let's say, softer form of exercise, like yeah. yoga, which nice. I could not get into at all. It was a bit of a come down. Yeah. <laughs> So then I thought, okay, there, there's aerobics, there's Zumba, there's all these things that I could do. And then our well-being lead here decided we should do something as a staff. Yeah. So last time we had yoga, mm -hmm. and after this break, we're getting a, I think it's a cardio and toning class. Yeah, that's right. So I don't even need to, again, go home and source something. Like yeah. The exercise happened right here in the yeah. hall downstairs, and it's all the teachers together in their leggings and sweatbands, <laughs> and just having a good time remarkable. after the kids have gone. Yeah. yeah, that's really, really remarkable. Something that is like so powerful in terms of that, it not only develops your own well-being, but it's the collegiality as well. Mm. And the convenience of having it at the school site, that's really, really powerful. Yeah, it's great. So we, we used to have other, let's say, exercise classes that we did here, but we found they could be quite inconsistent. Yeah. So what we started doing is we almost made up our own exercise club yeah. with the staff, just lower the screen, on YouTube, yeah. finding maybe a Joe Wicks video or something. Yeah. And we just work out in the hall, just a team of us, and then go home. Nice. And I think those little things that we did together are what makes us a little bit different yeah. to other primary schools. Yeah. And it's where a lot of the bonds are formed because mm. you hardly see each other throughout yes. the day. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do get together to exercise or to go on a CPD course together, mm. that's when you really bond yeah. Yeah, with your colleagues. You mentioned strict, funny. What's the third one? I, that's quite tough. So I might go with kind. Nice. Only because I'm always looking at them and what they need. Yeah. And if they need something, I don't hesitate to get it for them. And right. I know some might reprimand me for spending my money, but I think if I need something and if the school is sticking to budgets and so on, I just think, let's, let's get it. Yeah. Find I'll be reimbursed yeah. through their joy. Mm -hmm. it, it's worth it. Yeah, I love that. So small things like a homework folder, I got them a homework folder each so their books are nice and neat. And it's just teaching them when you get to high school, get one of these, yeah. pop your book in it. I said, yeah. never hand in chewed up homework. Mm -hmm. There's no need for it to look like that. Yeah. Get yourself one of these. Setting the foundations for organization, right? And I think that's so key. And mm -hmm. a lot of our kids don't have someone who's setting those role, well, let's say being a good role model, should I say, excuse me. Mm. And I think it's key for us to stop and remember why we're here and mm -hmm. why we got into this job because it's so, Oh, you can become so dwarfed by all the other facets that you know teachers have to put up with dealing with social worker issues mm. or CP you thinking about have they had breakfast have is their uniform clean are they getting on with so-and-so mm. are they late for school every day there's so many other things to think about that you can forget why you're here in the first place and I think that it's important to keep that wide vision, especially yeah. as a team leader. Absolutely. And not to forget that we got in this because we wanted to help mm. 
to make better, to provide, you know, to lead, to guide. What's been your, what would you say has been your proudest moment as a teacher? Um, oh, I've had a few. So I think one that stands out is probably when we used to set the children as such. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a set that weren't very good at what they do, yeah. a middle and then one that was great, mm -hmm. which is the model in many schools, but we just found it wasn't for us. Right. But I was here when we did have that and I was working with the children who struggled the most, mm -hmm. let's say, and straight away you feel like, okay, so who decided mm -hmm. that you needed to be here? Right. Like who made that decision? You mm -hmm. don't question anyone, mm -hmm. but you do think about it. And then you have to look at, okay, well, where do you need to get to? And it was, I used to describe it as putting Shetland ponies in the Grand National. Mm. So you've told them all this time mm. that they're this group sure. who can't really do much. And mm. they know, yeah. they look around and they're like, okay, I know where I am. Mm. But then they get to year six and the expectations are equal. And straight away you feel like they're at a disadvantage. Mm. But I worked with a group, I'd say about 15 of them. And by the end of the year, the gains they had made matched the children who were in let's say the most able group wow. and some surpassed wow. and all it took was for someone to say you know what you can do this yeah don't let anybody tell you that oh well you're in miss brown's group oh i know you're in miss and i just thought hey like yeah so what and that made me can more... i just give you a high five for that <laughs> that's just like completely transformational in terms of how you set the children up yeah i even i was um in another interview I was speaking to a head teacher called Claire Walsh and she was saying that I was asking her you know how she became a head teacher and what inspired her to become a head and she was like the moment she started teaching everyone just said you need to be a head you're going to be a great head you're going to be a great head and we had this this verbal exchange where I was like it's amazing how the words that are insti instilled in you by mm -hmm. other people then really start to enforce who you are yeah. imagine like being six and just told you're a genius right the way through to your do you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying it's like really building those building blocks to set you up in terms of self-confidence quite, quite powerful and you have to as well because you know i know i've said it before but if you are the only person who says well done mm. or great job or that's amazing mm. in that child's day, mm. you need to say it at least three times. Yeah. You need to keep telling them that <laughs> what they're doing is fantastic. And that's all I did with that group. Mm. You can do it, I believe in you. We can do this, what's stopping you? And then before I knew it, I could have cried yeah. like, by the end when I saw what they did because they believed that they could. Yeah. Phenomenal. And I just thought, if you can do that, in a short space of time. Imagine what you can do across a child's primary, yeah. a, across the primary life from one to six or from reception to year, to year six. But then we looked at that as a model and we decided at the school that we don't want yeah. anybody banded at all. You oh, know, yeah. we tried it, it didn't work. They have to be mixed. They have to be among peers who think faster or who think slower or yeah. who bring something different to the table in and each lesson life, right? of course mm. because you won't always be in a set where everybody looks the same or thinks the same or mm. wants the same or achieves the, th the same it's so it's so varied and the school itself is so varied when yeah. you look at the face of it mm -hmm. so we can't create a group of kids that are the same yeah you know? i think the powerful thing that you said there is that it, it just wasn't for us yeah and you know each school each community has their own philosophy about what works for them this is something that i talk about a lot you know like when we look at american schooling culture and there's some really great stuff going on over there and then it's like when sometimes you look at it as growing up in the english culture of education you look at it and you go well that won't work here, that won't work here. And it's like, okay, so stop, I suppose picking out all the things that won't work, think about what will work and mm -hmm. how you can then create it because their culture is different and they will have things that are different and will have things that won't work. But it's like, what are the, what are the gold nuggets that you can take away and that you can implement and then make it work for your, for your surrounding. So you said that you were, that the children would describe you as fun funny yeah so i'm gonna put you to the test oh okay. <laughs> Ooh, no pressure <laughs> what's been your funniest moment as a teacher would it be something i've done or something that they have done any 
Okay, so <laughs> there have been so many, and I can be honest about that. Yeah. There was one in particular. So this cohort I taught in year one. Yeah. And there was one boy who tried to convince me that he was friends with Percy Jackson. Now, I know Percy Jackson <laughs> is a fictional character, <laughs> but this year one, who would have been five, was had it out with me. Yeah. That No, Percy Jackson is he's a, he's a guy, I know him, you haven't made him up. Mm. And I said, okay, I didn't make him up, but somebody made him up. Right. And we went for it. Yeah. And then afterwards I was like, I'm battling with a five-year-old here. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved his determination to yeah. tell me that he knew this guy and he was real. He was mm. not made up. But that's just one in, in many. I've had some really good times. Mm. Really, really, really good times. Yeah. Charlene, you've been an absolute pleasure to speak with and to learn from and all of the great things that you've shared from Singapore Maths to talk for writing to the inspiration of how you've transformed children's thinking and pushed them to the higher level and so much in between. It's been an absolute pleasure and I know that the audience are going to take a great deal away from it. Oh, so I hope I so. Thank you from the bottom oh, of my heart. Oh, you're most welcome. It's been my pleasure. Been my pleasure. It's not over. Oh. So, <laughs> we have a quick fire round. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna say something and you're going to say the first word or phrase or thing that comes to your mind. Okay, cool. Books. Reading. Family. Love. Culture. Caribbean. Favourite app on your phone? Pinterest. Oh, interesting. I've never used Pinterest. You Why? definitely should. Why? Ideas galore. Really? It's absolutely fantastic, yeah. Right. Alex, I'm logging on to Pinterest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorted. Favourite book you've read this year? Or in the last 12 months? Oh, okay. I've read a few. I've actually started reading more with the kids, so mm. I would go with... We've just read Wonder together. Okay. Great book. Yeah. What's it about? So it's about a young boy who is born with a face deformity. Yes, I've heard of that. Yeah. My mm. friend was telling me to watch it on And Netflix. then has a space helmet and, yeah. you know, tries to integrate himself into mainstream school and the it? struggles. Read the book first. Okay. We have a copy. You're more... Oh, there it is. Light right. blue. You're Sorted. more than welcome to borrow. Perfect. Sorted. Thank you. Favourite holiday destination? So far? Oh, that's tricky. So I've had great holidays with great people, mm. but in terms of a destination, I would say Miami. Okay, nice. Been there. High five on that one too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cancun, live it up, for sure. <laughs> okay, next one. Most overused phrase in school? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. I think we should stop saying no and more, well, why? Yeah. Why, would, why do you want to do that? Or yeah. why do you think that? Yeah. I've read a stat that by the age of um, seven, a child on average has heard the word no 15,000 times. Yeah, I'm not surprised by and that. And they've heard the word yes just 5,000 times. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what I, I think like I could learn from that as well. Yeah, what I like to do, instead of using the word no, I like to redirect. So if a child says, I don't know, can I have a banana, please? Or can I have a cake? You go, you can have a banana in half an hour. Or you can have this. Or what you can do is sit down and read a book with daddy. Or mm. whatever it is, right? I redirect it. So then I, the focus is on the positive action that's happening as yeah. opposed to, no, you can't do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'd say no. I don't know if that's a phrase, but. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important word and one that um, we need to be very comfortable with, with, with using because it is, it, it is powerful. And when we get into like leadership, that's something that. Um, that people hesitate to use and like mm -hmm. have this like soft approach. I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but you have to be very confident and comfortable. Yeah, to say courageous it. conversations. Love it. We call them here. Love it. We can't like be scared that. to have them. We can't. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And what's the parting piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring teacher, or in yeah, aspiring teacher that wanted to make a difference? I would say to start with believing that you can mm -hmm. make the difference mm -hmm. and then I would also say to face the challenges with a positive with a positive head mm -hmm. because there will be challenges and there were challenges I guess for all of us getting into teaching getting into a school but it's looking at why mm. why you got into it in the first mm. place what we call here the long look 
So it's thinking about, okay, well, that's what I want to do. And there will be things along the way that might hinder my progress, but it's not going to stop me from getting there in the end. Mm. Fantastic, fantastic. I wish we had an audience here to give me a big round of applause, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank amazing. you. It's been amazing.